to me, you whining little whelp. From the Getty's Bike Tour studio. Hey, everyone, it's Cameron. Shut up! You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg Today. There is no time. Hello, exactly. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this very special edition of Addressing Gettysburg Today. I am Matt, and with me, as always, is Veronica Brustensky Esquire, our... The Johnny Cochran of Franklin County, I think is what they call you, right? Right, Yes, the uh, esteemed criminal defense attorney. Uh, And, of course, (laughs) Eric... things, too, but we'll just... (laughs) Whatever it is, you're esteemed. (laughs) And, uh, of course, Eric, the producer, is uh, there in the corner. Uh, Today, we have uh, a very special guest with us, and we're we're not going to do as much of the banter as we do in the beginning. In fact, that was the extent of it. Uh, So let's get right uh, to it. We've got a lot of calls in the queue, but in case you didn't know... Um, we've been talking about it for almost a week now. Uh, Steve Sims, superintendent of Gettysburg National Military Park, is with us. And welcome, Steve. Thank you very much. It's my honor. It, it's our honor. Thank you very much for coming on. We had a coffee the other day, uh, which I found very enjoyable. Actually, I had a hot chocolate, but I still it was just as enjoyable as a coffee. And our conversation was okay, what was I, enjoyable. I was going to yeah. ask if the drink was on it. Okay. You got to pull no. stuff out well, of Well, both. Sometimes. A lot of things were <laughs> enjoyable. Um, but uh, we, we talked about doing this. And I got to tell you, I was very surprised that uh, when I said I would love it if you came on the show, you're like, okay. I'm like, just like that. I've never had a government official uh, so easily say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I got to check to see if I was drinking coffee that morning. Uh, but yeah, no, it's it's um, very important that, uh, you know, I start getting out into the community a little bit more. Um, and I've recognized that. And it's it's my pleasure to be here and to, to answer questions. You said there's lots of questions and information out there that's floating around. And the park's been silent. Tons of yes. pretty quiet. Yes. And I agree. Yeah. So um, I'm here. And, you know, let me try to help answer those questions good now so you you had mentioned uh that uh the park had been silent and everything like that and that was something that we kind of touched on when we were talking um and you gave me a pretty good reason as to why we haven't heard so much from the park or from you especially do you remember what the reason was you want me to refresh your memory okay (laughs) well when you came in um the lockdown was soon after but you came in with specific tasks right you 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 were tasked to kind of like bring this place into compliance, correct? Yeah. So every time a superintendent switches out, uh, they have what they call transition management uh, assistance program. And so there's other people that come into the park. They survey the employees. They survey the the, uh, partners in the community. And they they write a laundry list for the incoming superintendent to say, here's what you need to focus on. And as you may recall, when I got here, it was after about two and a half years of rotating superintendents. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that that didn't leave a lot of continuity. Um, It didn't really help with relationships. It didn't really help with managing the park and, uh, you know, leading the staff, if you will. Sure. So, yeah, I had a list and it was pretty clear that I had a lot of housekeeping to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, I needed to... um, Clean house is not the right words to use, but I needed to... Bring your house in order. Bring my house in order. Sure. You're welcome. So that's what I focused on. With COVID, you know, I got here two months later. We're in the midst of COVID. So everything's shutting down. So I really had an opportunity to look inward and focus on, you know, what are the policies that we're following? You know, the laws. What are we doing? Get to know the park. um, Get to know, you know, my staff. And Mm -hmm. uh, so I I really jumped in and... uh, I think we did a lot of good things getting the house in order, uh, and and now I feel that this is now the right time to really shift my focus and um, get out into the community more. So it wasn't that you were neglecting the public. It was that you were very like hyper-focused on fixing things internally first. Is that Would that be a fair assessment? You know, fixing um, might be too strong of a word. I mean, a lot of it was learning. Okay. Uh, learning what was going on, learning about this park and the passion of the community. Oh, yeah. Uh, learning what's worked, what hasn't worked, um, and supporting the staff because, you know, I'm a huge believer in, you know, collaborative management style. And, uh, you know, if I can take care of the staff, then I know they're going to take care of the park. 
So right. I wanted to make sure they were taken care of. So there's a lot of organizational stuff. And of course, we're a bureaucracy. So there's there's tons of rules and policies mm. that, uh, you know, we, we're checking down. Where are we on this? How are we organized? How are we getting this done? Are we trying to chew off too much? Do we have a thorough and clear plan on how we're going to do things? So that's that's what we did. Did when you where were you before here? Valley Forge. Valley Forge. Yes. And is the passion that uh, the visitors to Valley Forge have uh, uh, on par with Gettysburg's, or are we a lot more insane? Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I know would you say wouldn't say it that way, but that there's. Um, a lot more engagement from the Gaysburg community okay. than the Valley Forge community. Valley Forge is, is a great spot. I'm sure many of you, it's beautiful. many of the listeners have been there before. Um, but it's like the one green space within Montgomery County. Okay. And so they've got lots of bike trails, so lots of recreational use. Um, they uh, they get about 2 million visitors per year, which Gaysburg only you know, looks at about a million but the visitor center at Valley Forge only gets 200,000. Mm. And the visitor center here gets about 500,000. Mm-hmm. So I think that really kind of paints a picture of who's really coming to the park, who are your visitors. And so we have a lot of um, you know, dog walkers. I mean, we have them here in Gaysburg sure. too, but you know, Valley Forge is a little bit more relaxed. I have a question about the numbers. Um, and people always ask me, how does the park determine the number of visitors you get? Um, and I say, I have no idea. Because it, it, it can't just be through the visitor center because people don't always just go to the visitor center. They just go to the park. And there's many ways to get into the park. So how can you, on such a porous, bordered park like ours, how do you keep track of who comes into the park? So there's uh, numbers that we track. So we have counters throughout the park. So you know, vehicle counters. We have the visitor center numbers. Uh, and then we send it to the social scientists of the National Park Service, and they, they crank out a number. Okay. And so that's... In a nutshell, how <laughs> that's it's how determined. you figure it out. Okay. In other words, I don't really know. So but when I'm like, a... <laughs> when I'm like driving on Hancock Avenue or something, and I run over one of those tubes that wasn't there a couple of days yeah, we're ago, we're taking a photo of you, or tracking your license plate <laughs> and your cell phone number. Uh, and we got I knew you. it. I knew it. That's it. I'm Kidding. walking from now on. No, of course. But that is that's one of those counters, isn't it? Uh, sh- yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. I've, it's like uh, in the old service stations when you'd go in and you'd ride over this tube and it would ring a bell. Remember those? I do, but yeah. I'm trying to picture where they are on they're the They're not there all the time. Oh, okay. Right? I'm they're not there all the time. They're permanent. No, they're not. Yeah. They are? Yeah. Where? Where are you? Well, I'm thinking, I remember, I remember driving over one on Hancock Avenue. Yeah. That's permanent? Yeah. No. Okay. Well, well you're the what boss. What you drove so over might not be it. Um, oh, okay. I think they're actually boxes on the side with like a little... Oh, like a little laser or something that, you know, yeah. Okay. Then that's, I'm talking about something totally different, but okay, whatever. So that's, okay. So that's how you count that. And then the visitor center has their own way. The foundation has their own way of counting who goes in there as well. Yeah. Very precise actually. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. So, um, when you come here to Gettysburg, um, having been at Valley Forge was a kind of a, a little bit of a culture shock once you started to realize how, how nuts we are about the place. (laughs) <laughs> it, it wasn't a culture shock. Uh, you know, again, I think it was just learning because, uh, okay. you know, there's 423 national park units out there and they're they're all different. Yes. You know, the, they're all unicorns in a way. And so, you know, if you're at Yellowstone, you've got, you know, you know lots of different things. You've got, you've got people putting bison in their cars and, and you know, <laughs> major storms and floods yes. and geysers. Um, and so you have to manage those natural resources. You come to Gettysburg and you've got... Uh, something very, very different. Mm-hmm. You've got a place uh, of, in American history where there's you know, a sig- significant battle, a very crucial battle. Um, and not only that, you have all the stories of individuals. You have the stories of why the battle happened, the context of the Civil War. And then you have uh, you know, African-American stories, the women and children. You have immigrant stories. I mean, there's just got so much there. And, and, and I think this is the beautiful thing about the National Park Service is that you know it – it protects America's heritage, mm-hmm. and it is the storybook of America. And so um, regardless of your background, where you're from, what your interests are, I think there's something for everybody in the National Park Service. So you can make a connection. And once you can make that connection to that special place, you become a co-owner mm-hmm. of that space. And I consider all you Gettysburgians and everyone that's listening here a co-owner of this place. And the the as, proper term is Getty's nerds. Getty's, thank you. You're welcome. Sir, <laughs> I, I'm still learning. Uh, and, and as co-owner, you have a responsibility to preserve, sure. protect, and share yeah. this special place. And 
Let me know what I'm not doing right, which I think some have. <laughs> and let me know what I am doing right, which some have too. I mean, it's it's a relationship. Sure. And so it, it needs to be cultivated because I'm, I'm just a civil servant. I'm not here for me. I'm See, here for this place. I can appreciate that um, for sure because, uh, you know, when in the, in the early days when we didn't hear much um, from the park about things that were changing, um, my thing was like, oh, it's just this another bureaucrat who's got his little fiefdom and, you know, he's going to. But I stand corrected on thinking that. I didn't express that out loud exactly in those words, but um, I do stand corrected after sitting with you. And now as we're talking now, I understand a lot more. And there's always something you know, like we all don't know what you know. And you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. there's a lot more to it than what we can figure. And then, you know, you people speculate and they make up rumors or they hear a rumor, you know, and who knows what to believe. So that's why I think this is great that you're on here doing this. Um, can, I, what, can I ask yeah, a question? Yeah, of course. So all national parks are within the Department of the Interior. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And then do different national parks have different mission statements? National military park as opposed to, for example, Yosemite or something like that? Or is it... Right. So there's one National Park Service mission okay. yeah, to preserve and protect in perpetuity the natural and cultural resources and values of that national park. And then to um, share that for the visitor. Yeah, so the, you know, provide that for the visitor enjoyment and education. So that's the core mission of the National Park Service. But each national park unit is separately legislated. So you have enabling legislation. So Congress has to say, make this a national park unit and that then becomes, okay, what are we focusing on? What is our period of significance? What are the resources and values that we're here to serve and protect? Oh, interesting. Okay, thank you mm -hmm. for clarifying that. Well, so resources and, and, and all that stuff, um, b b let's go into the beavers. So we'll start with the beavers. Man, you're starting big. <laughs> let's start with the big one. <laughs> Get Come that out, out of the, the gate way. strong here, man. <laughs> well, the beavers have been very controversial. Here we, in Addressing Gettysburg, we made t-shirts, Team Beaver, Team Mozart. <laughs> People who want the beavers to swim around and flap their little tails, and people who want to uh, who c are concerned more about the monument being flooded away. And um, I'm happy to say, Team Mozart is winning by one T-shirt in sales, so that's good. But um, <laughs> we sell three of them all together. Uh, Eleven. <laughs> so, so my question is, um, well, not not question, but well, would you? Clear the air for us. What is the deal with the beavers? Absolutely. Um, let me let me start by um, kind of tagging on to what you said about the fiefdom. <laughs> okay, okay, sure. Um, <laughs> because uh, you know, I think it's relevant in that the decisions that I make are going to be rooted in policy, law, and regulation. Right. Um, so when we have issues like beavers, I'm going to the policies, the National Park Service policies. What's to say my responsibilities are to this resource? Because again, I'm not here for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I need to be consistent. So if I have this issue with beavers or I have some other issue that's uh, somewhat related, I want to be consistent in how we address these things. So beavers. So National Park Service policy says you allow natural processes to proceed um, and don't interfere with them unless you have some impact to the cultural resources or infrastructure, roadways, that's when you would step in and intervene in that process. Okay. So with the beavers, um, and they've been quite um, active, there's, there's, I think there's four separate dams I think so, in that yeah. space right now. And um, and I'll get to your point. Okay. I do want to say they are excellent volunteers, probably our best, most dependable volunteers, because they're clearing the woods, <laughs> yeah. the vegetation, <laughs> right. keeping that area clear, keeping that view shed sure, uh, okay. open for us. All right. um, one point for the beavers. One, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but the resources, uh, like the monuments and the markers, um, we're monitoring those. And we're, we're keeping an eye on those. So if, you know, the foundation of the monument starts to subside or if the roadway starts to be undermined, we're going to take action at that point to say, oh, beavers, you've taken it too far. We've okay. got to intervene. But so far, there's been no measurable, identified, documented, anything damage to the resources. So the um, – we're going to continue to monitor. We think that they are going to leave at some point in the future. They're not a permanent fixture. Mm -hmm. Beavers usually stay until they consume the resources of that space, and then they move on. My hope is they keep moving on down to Slaughter Pen right. in that area, <laughs> right? Yes. And um, then, you know, so the you know, Plum Run, uh, as 
as far as we know, there's no impact to that alignment, to that landscape. It's still there. Um, the integrity of that space is still there. It's just pretty wet. Yeah. It's, yeah. Now, there's the one dam that's closest to the bridge that appears to have been breached. Did, was that natural, or did the park do that? Or So, yeah, it, at one point, we thought the beavers might have left. Right. And so, you know, the biologist goes out there and like, oh, let's pull this piece of the, the dam down because, you know, the beavers are going to come back and patch that immediately. Right. And so we pulled part of it down and we waited. And um, ultimately, though, they, they did repair. So we're like, oh, they're still around. But we okay. did, for a while there, we thought they had moved on. So that was so – pull. so the park did do that to see if they would come and – Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. And that we have sense. cameras up night, you know. It was cameras. quite a while, though, that uh, that they didn't patch that up. I mean, it's been – did they patch it up or? They did. They did recently. Eventually. Yeah. They yeah. should be complacent beavers. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> they must not travel that far south. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, so, uh, so okay. I, I'm, my answer, or the answer, I think I'm pretty uh, satisfied with that answer as to why the beavers were able to go. Do you have any further questions on the beaver? Because she's team beaver. Oh, absolutely team beaver. <gasps> I mean, there was no... There was, Heretic. There was never any fear, I don't think, of the Mozart regiment like uh, monument, you know. Uh, floating going, away. No, no, yeah, who right, said I mean, that? Nobody I mean, said it would rocks don't typically anything. float. Like, yeah. Right. I mean, everybody was losing their minds about this. <clears throat> Actually, I'll give, I see Ken Rich's card and I'll give him a shout out. I mean, he had a suggestion that, you know, as you said, Superintendent, four different dams. If the one that's closest to the monument is the big deal, knock that one down. Mm -hmm. What's, it's not harming anything up upstream more i mean there's different ways to handle it and but but as steve pointed out they will repair it they will so you'll, it'll be a constant like it'll be like a benny hill skit or something if you speed it up it'd be funny looking you know much like i mean what, what you're saying though is leave things be right when a when a tree falls if it falls across the road obviously you have to take care of that but if it falls on the hillside for the most part you guys let that stuff kind of go that's sure. nature and animals are nature like it or not yeah. right like yeah. it's not like somebody brought something that's not natural here like an alligator or something right. but it, you know i mean yeah. that would not be fun this, this yeah. is so much like my management team <laughs> so I, I just listen oh, and i wait for people to come to a conclusion <laughs> well how about this though uh our i don't know um if we're doing it this year but in years past they've called the deer herd mm -hmm. uh, do, do we uh, what's the difference between that and the beavers yeah so this is before my time so it's been decades that they've been calling the deer and so what they um, decided back then was, hey, the deer are overbrowsing. There's too many deer. And it's, one, not healthy for the deer population, but it's also you know, not good for native vegetation. It's not good for the wood line. And so they, they did, uh, through a public process, they put a plan together to determine what is the right amount of deer per, I guess, acre or square mile, can't remember mm -hmm. which, um, which would leave you a healthy population, allow forest regeneration, um, and native vegetation. Plus, you know, we've got farmers who are trying to make a living. Mm -hmm. And so we want to, you know, strike that balance as well. So, yes, we still cull the deer. Um, I think we actually started last weekend. Oh, they're doing it now? Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. And do they, what do they do? Just tranquilize them and remove them or do they kill them and eat them? So, <laughs> yes. So we, we actually have a contract with the uh, USDA. Okay. And so they have sharpshooters and uh, they come in and they, they kill the deer. And we test them for chronic wasting disease. Every deer gets tested. And when we get the test reports back, if it's healthy, and so far every one of them has been healthy, we haven't had any indications of anything, um, we send it to uh, you know, a processor. They process the meat. And then it gets donated. Okay. And so I think this year United Way is uh, handling all the donations. And I'm trying to think, I apologize, I don't remember how many pounds we donated last year, but it's in the thousands. A pound. So really? It goes to good use. That's great. None of it got to my good use. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, I love that. That's all right. Um, let's let's take a caller now. Um, I'll sp sprinkle them in here as we go through. Um, I believe this is our friend Michael. Six questions. Lens. Is that you, Mike? Oh yeah, it's definitely me. Okay. How you doing, Mike? <laughs> I'm doing well. Uh, well, thank you for being on the program. Um, I just have a, a question about the guide service. And some of the rumors that have been going around have been as extreme as they're looking to get rid of the guide service to really just looking to see where the visitation numbers are to understand what the relationship of the park will be with the guide service. Can you shed any light what, of what the relationship will be moving forward with the licensed paddlefield guides? Yeah. So, Mike, is it? Yes. 
Mike, thank you very much for the yep. question. So actually, last night we had our fall meeting with the Licensed Biofield Guide uh, service, so we met with them. And they actually kind of had the same question, too. Uh, and I'll tell you, so the Licensed Battlefield Guides are part of the National Park Service mission. You know, they have their own law um, that establishes that any tour for a fee has to be done by a Licensed Battlefield Guide, and we license those guides. So fundamentally, um, they have to be here. They have to be here, fundamentally. Secondly, um, I feel personally that they provide a critical service, a critical, critical service to our visitors because, you know, they are experts. Mm -hmm. They are phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, you know, second to none, really. I mean, I agree. If I take my rangers out of that conversation, I mean, they're second to none. It's a different. Right. I guess yeah. my rangers. Uh, but they are a great um, community. And. We are currently going through a long-range interpreter plan to look at what is that future of interpretation in the park, and we're having the LBGs be part of that and give us input and feedback. Um, I know LBGs uh, work for a lot of uh, leadership companies, providing some excellent oh, yeah. professional services. I mean, they, they do something that we can't do. They really do huh. uh, on a recurring basis. And um, you know, whether it's a Segway tour, a horse tour, a bus tour, a car tour, a bike tour, I mean, they do it all, and mm -hmm. it's amazing. And uh, they can, you know, talk to a, a visitor and ask them where they're from, and then they immediately have a connection yeah. from this battle that they can bring to them. And they help bring that personal connection, you know, that connection we talked about earlier, to national parks. Because without the public, national parks will cease to exist. Yep. So that's where I see the licensed battlefield guides and that program being just critically important. The challenge with the licensed battlefield guide program, in my view, is that it's a 1915 law. Yeah. And the 1915 law didn't envision things yes. that we're having today. I agree. Um, and how people visit. So I think we've made some, um, I don't know that we made any changes, but I, th I think we're in a good place with the licensed battlefield guides. Um, Right now, we're evaluating data on visitation and you know how many people are using them, how many turnaways to determine when the next test would be mm -hmm. to license more guides. So we haven't compiled that data yet. We don't have a, a criteria for how we're going to decide that. But there's 140 licensed battlefield guides right now, um, and yeah, they're wonderful. They're they they're part of us. Um, so you you brought up the 1915 law, and I want you to go into that a little bit more what your point was about bringing that up because i can just imagine somebody watching this and going ah oh, see 1915 law he's saying it's antiquated they're going to get rid of us so clarify thank you what for the opportunity. You, you're welcome <laughs> so you know i think one of the challenges that we had uh at least when i got here is that we had groups that had traditionally been able to sell tours on the battlefield that weren't using licensed battlefield guides there was i think an exception that was provided previously and I'm going back to uh, what's the law say? What discretion do I have? Because I, you know, contrary to maybe what people may think, I don't have a lot of discretion, mm -hmm. <laughs> discretionary authority. So I wanted to make sure that we were um, following the law, which required some of these other groups that weren't using licensed battlefield guides. They may have been using experts and scholars and authors, but they're not licensed guides. So that was a really tough thing for some of those groups to. Um, move towards those licensed battlefield guides, but that's what the law said. And so okay. I think that really actually helps, um, I don't know if protect is the right word, but support the licensed battlefield guide program because that's what the law says. If it's a paid tour, it's them. Right. And the only exceptions to that are schools, staff rides. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's the licensed battlefield guide. And uh, you, you mentioned that you don't have a lot of discretion or, or as much discretion as people may think you do. You're also not coming in here and making up policy out of whole cloth or rules out of whole cloth, correct? There's a procedure. There's a process. There's a process. You can't just come in here and dictate things. No, and that's not what you're doing. No, and I, and I feel like I, I know Gettysburg well enough to know I can't go into this with half the information or with right. you know a half-baked idea yeah. because I'm just going to get... Y yes. Uh, yes, we have to say the word. <laughs> so... You know, just like, you know, the two of you were talking about the beavers earlier. That's what we do with my staff. That's what we do with our stakeholders. And I, I just enjoy listening because right. I learn at the same time. But I have the experts in the room. Right. Okay. And I lean on the experts. The experts, you know, technically, the experts in policy, and they inform the decision. And we strive for consensus. Okay. Or we run it up the flagpole. We yeah. do that a lot, too. Or talk to a solicitor. 
Yes, uh, yeah, that, I guess that would be important is talking to the solicitor. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Mike, thank you very much for the call. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Well, thank you. All right, talk to you later. Uh, let's take one more caller. We got a bunch in here, so let me clear out the queue a little bit and then we'll talk uh, without them for a bit more. Uh, caller, I don't have a name there, so you're on the air. Hey, Matt, it's Bill. Oh, hey, Bill, how are you doing? Good. Good evening, uh, Superintendent Sims. Hi, Bill. Um, cold cell rehab a couple years ago. Great idea. Great step forward. The area now has started to overgrow. Was there a plan in place to maintain that? And if not, why not? Hmm. Bill, that's a phenomenal question. That is. And a Thank great you, question and a timely question because we have um, what they call an ACE crew. Uh, I think they showed up or they're showing up this week. And uh, we hired them, and uh, it's, it's a conservation group. And they're the ones that actually did the clearing a couple of years ago, and they're back to maintain it. Okay. So we have, uh, you know, when I came into this um, job, one of the first things was um, we had an individual that wanted to get this job done. You know, he'd been talking with the park for a long time, and he just, like, wanted a decision. And so I was um, informed that, yeah, the park had agreed to this. And so we worked together um, to make this happen, and this, um, this gentleman uh, donated the money to do the clearing, uh, was engaged with us in um, thinking through how to do that. But then one of my requirements was, you know, I am not going to do anything, especially new things, if we can't maintain it, if we can't sustain this investment, because I don't want anybody that's donating money, time to this place, I don't want it wasted, because mm -hmm. it's precious. And um, so when we did this project, the, there was an endowment that was created so that we can maintain the 16 acres that we cleared. Um, and that's what we're actually going to start, uh, if not this week, next week, uh, clear that out. But I'll tell you some of the challenges. I mean, one, there's a couple of things along with maintaining that is one, we wanted to see how the forest would respond. So we okay. weren't sure once we did some of this clearing, you know, we want to make sure that we left enough uh, forest to regenerate. So we weren't just doing a wholesale clearing of everything smaller than six inches in size. We wanted to leave a whole a variety of sizes of trees in there. We wanted to take out the invasives. Um, so we wanted to see how that's going to respond and then uh, see if there's invasives that pop up now that the sunlight's hitting the forest floor. And then we wanted to see how the visitor responded to that space. Uh -huh. So we formalized the trails through there and we put a wayside near Bitter's Rock. And so one of the challenges that we're finding is that people aren't staying on trail. Yeah. And so they're just walking all over the place, and that's not um, healthy for that space. And then uh, the trails are also getting washed out. So, you know, there's some things there that we're learning so that we can continue to improve upon the process of when we do these clearings. You know, what do we need to be prepared for? What do we need to make sure we invest in? How do we make sure this is sustainable? Um, but, yes, you're absolutely right. It has grown. And we are going to get back in there and uh, bring it back to where it was when we first cleared it. Anything else, Bill? Uh, yes, actually, I have a second question, if that's okay. All right. Two questions. That's corn. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, within the living history community, there is a lot of rumor and speculation that there's going to be new rules on how to be on the battlefield and do living history. Mm. Are there current rules and are they going to be modified to discourage living history on the battlefield? Are you talking, Bill, specifically about the that you have to have 20 people? Uh, 20 people, and one of the rumors I heard that there's no longer going to be firearms permitted on the battlefield oh. within the living history context. Never heard that one. Okay. All right, Steve, uh, what about that? And, Bill, thanks for the call. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to drop the call because i got to get other people in the queue here. Thank you, Bill. Um, okay, thanks, Matt. Can I ask a clarifying question? I guess it's oh, too Oh, shit. I just hung up on <laughs> <laughs> Well, go ahead. So I, I might be able to clarify. Go ahead. <laughs> so, you know, the question I have is with living history, um, is it a park-organized living history program or is it something separate? I believe he's talking about the, the park-organized ones. Yes. I've, I've okay. heard that rumor as well that, from, uh, from that Mike. beginning next year, there's going to be a your, – your group, if you're going to do living history at the park, uh, at one of the sanctioned sites, you have to have a minimum of 25 in your group. Oh, 25. That, oh, that I was, heard 20. Okay. That was what I heard. Okay. So I don't know the answer to this, frankly. Hmm. 
and um, I would I will need to get back to this. I do know, or it's been shared with me that the living, living history community has gotten a lot smaller. Yeah, and yeah. and I'm not familiar with how many different units there might be, but I, I'm understanding, and, and you all tell me if I have an incorrect understanding that some of these units are really small, and so the oh, suggestion is that they merge to become a larger living history unit so that when we are doing the program, it is um, something that, you know, the visitor will see, hey, it's not just two people, yeah. but it's actually a, a company, which, sure. you know, has a little bit more impact and somebody can say, oh, I get it versus just a couple people out there. I should have kept Bill on the phone because when we, we were talking about this a couple months ago and um, I said, well, why don't you, some, one of you guys step up be a leader and say to all the other groups hey this is the new rule so we're all small let's band together well and yeah but that's what he said he goes well because it's like i'm not a reenactor but from what i understand it's very uh what's well, the word with, territorial or? yeah within that community there's they there don't like to a lot work of people together. that want to be in charge of something and whether that's a a fire team sized company uh, or a you know a squad sized regiment, yeah, they, they, <laughs> so, they just yeah. want to be in charge of it. Right. Sounds like we have more work to do together. <laughs> yes. To figure this <laughs> yes. out. Because yes. we want to make sure that if it's a park service program, that it meets you know the expectation of the visitor. Mm -hmm. Sure. And um, we'll just have to figure that out. But but to your knowledge, as of right now, there's not like any new rule going into place next year that's that's going to limit groups who are who just cannot come up with 25 people or more yeah i think i might be answering that um i don't i don't want to answer that because i don't Fair know enough. what because yeah. i'm not directly involved with working with the living okay. history community and i don't want to say something that's incorrect Fair um because i don't know what may have been said but i i do know i, I will say this living history is Phenomenal. Yeah. It is absolutely necessary um, because I think it's, you know, two things. One, you've got people that, you know, have a connection, a lineage, a passion for this history, and they are poised to share it mm -hmm. with our visitors in ways that maybe park rangers can't or maybe in ways that licensed bath those guides can't. I mean, this past 4th of July was just phenomenal. What was that? 4th Michigan? Did you see that? 1st Minnesota. 1st Minnesota. Yeah. Minnesota. Yeah. First Minnesota, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, we did a video on it. It was great. Yeah. Was um, that was fantastic. impactful. Yeah. When I yeah. saw that, boy, I'm just like... The Liberty Rifles do a fantastic yeah. job right no matter here. what they do. Yeah. 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 After the tornado that went through, I mean, it was great. <laughs> so... Um, so yeah, I, I think the, the bottom line is we want to figure out the living history question in the best way possible for, for everyone. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, let's go to uh, Aaron, I think, uh, on the phone here. Aaron, are you there? Hey, Matt, how's it going? Oh, Aaron, we did, this, this always happens. My, my talk to text uh, screener doesn't do a good job. Aaron, how are you doing? <laughs> Good, good. Thank you. Yourself? I'm fine. Thank you. What's your question for uh, Superintendent Sims? Well, uh, first of all, I want to compliment the Park Service on the Devil's Den rehab. I thought yeah. it turned out really well. The Agreed. walkways are great. I mean, Smith's battery has the fresh paint job looking, you know, very slick, very nice up yeah. there. So I think you guys should all be very proud. And I think that's going to be a great spot moving forward. Thank you. Um, my question has to do with the timing of the little round top rehab project. Um, it seems like it kind of shut down right after the battle anniversary this year. And I was just curious about that because it seems like there was still at least another two or three months of, of peak tourist season in there. Um, and then I guess kind of a follow-up question to that would be, um, has the closing of little round top affected visitor numbers for 2022 so far? All right, Aaron, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, for Thanks, the compliment on Devil's Den. Uh, <laughs> that was a six-month project uh, with the intent of rehabilitating those trails, uh, replace uh, the asphalt trails and the stone steps with exposed aggregate concrete and granite. Uh, and, yeah, the cannons got a free fresh as well. Um, and then, you know, I think Matt was there on our National right. Public Lands Day. Yep. So for all of you out there that are listening that were at the National Public Lands Day to do the clearing of Devil's Den... Thank you. Thank you. It looks awesome. So um, what we're doing in Devil's Den 
is kind of like on a, on a mini scale of what we're doing at Little Round Top. Right, so you're, okay. you should see the exact same type of exposed aggregate concrete sidewalks as well as the granite. Um, it's going to be, and if, if, if Aaron liked it, then I'm hoping everyone will like it when we reopen it. Yeah. So to answer the <laughs> timing, uh, welcome to federal appropriations and government contracting. Uh, so that project actually started, I think it was either 2009 or 2011. And uh, so it takes a decade uh, <laughs> plus to get to where we're at to actually put it in motion. But I'll go back to what I said earlier that we had that time period of two and a half years of rotating superintendents. Well, that project stopped during that time period. Uh -huh. So one of the first things I did when I got here was restarted that project, finished the design okay. so that we can get it moving again. Because we've got uh, donors that had donated money. And they're like, what's going on? It's been three years, four years, five years. So there was a lot of pressure and maybe self-imposed pressure on me to get that project started as soon as humanly possible. And so fast forward, what, two years? <laughs> we, we finish the design. We get all the approvals. Um, we get all the funding lined up. And then we have to hit government contracting cycles. Um, and we got the contract awarded, and then you have you know two or three months of working with the contractor to get approvals to actually mobilize to the site. So, okay. you know, and my philosophy with construction dollars is that when they're here, when you have them, time is money because if you're not doing it today, it's going to escalate and cost later on. Oh. So I pushed it as quickly as human and as, as quickly as possible, with the caveat of don't shut it down for battle anniversary. Okay. I think we shut down July 29th. Yeah, shut it was down twenty seventh, twenty ninth. Yeah, something. But with an well, eight month or eighteen month window, I mean, it's kind of inevitable that some big event is going to be <laughs> yeah. impacted by that, right? Yeah. Some it, calendar event, right? It's, and I understand the pain that people <laughs> feel with little round top clubs. Yeah. I mean, it is a very special place. Sure, uh, lots of stories, beautiful views, um, but I, I think the opportunity here. And in my eyes, because I'm National Park Services, it really highlights our preservation and protection mission. And that's, you know, part of what we got to do. We've got to balance use with preservation and protection. Yeah. And so Little Round Top, you've been there. Mm -hmm. It was loved, loved heavily. <laughs> and uh, so what we're going to do is rehabilitate it so that we can bring some native vegetation back so that we can create gathering spaces for people to gather. We're going to improve them so they can gather there, not in the vegetation that's now just worn away and now the, the hill's you know, sliding down. <laughs> um, it'll slide down into the pond and fill it up. <laughs> there no. you go. Uh, so we're That'll doing take that. Care of the beavers. And, you know, I think the other part of um, at least my personal thought process on the exposed aggregate concrete and the granite is that it really formalizes the place. And I, I feel, you know, when I walk into that space, Devil's Den, let's just say, I feel, oh, this is nice. Mm -hmm. I've got to behave. I've got to stay on the sidewalk. That's a good because point. Because this is a great... Oh, yeah, no, 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 I don't have a believer over here. <laughs> no. Anyways, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that it keeps people on those improved surfaces so that we can protect the rest of Little Round Top. Yeah. So it's a balance of pre preservation and protection and visitor use. Well, so let's let's touch on that because you mentioned we were talking about the the Culps Hill uh, clearing before, and you had mentioned that people go off the trails and and that's not desired. Um, but how in a six thousand acre uh, park do you discourage that? You know, I I think the um, primary way is through education. You know, we have to educate our visitors in what this place is, uh -huh. what preservation and protection means, and how we can responsibly use the space and still achieve your goals. It's your park. And so you're going to experience it in different ways. Right. And, and I'm not going to dictate how you visit it. I'm just going to say, hey, stay on trail. Um, you know, don't dig up artifacts. You know, things like that. Yes. Don't don't kill the deer yourselves. Like I handled. Uh, you know, Volunteerism we're going to... is good, but not in every okay. circumstance. Right. So, yeah. so we want to put in place the right level of rules and regulations to manage this place to preserve it in perpetuity. Because the Park Service is in the forever business. And one day, we're all going to be gone. Mm. But this place still needs to be here. This yep. place still needs to look like it did 160, almost 160 years ago. So it's... That's what we're doing. Okay, good. Aaron, thank you very much for the call. Um, let's go on to uh, Andy here. Oops, I didn't mean to. Oh, I didn't answer the visitor numbers, by the way. 
What do you mean? Aaron had a two part yeah. comment. Oh, he did? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. What was the second part? What was the, what was <laughs> the answer to this? He was asked about the impact of the closure of Little Round Top on visitation numbers. Go ahead. It's a short answer. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right, very good. Sorry, I don't want to leave him hanging. <laughs> Andy from Smithfield, Virginia. Andy from Smithfield, you're on the air. That's my Larry King. <laughs> hey, Matt. First time, long time. How are you? <laughs> Thank um, you very much. Thank you. Hi, Superintendent Sims Road. Appreciate your time this evening. I've got a, a, it's really two questions, but the first one's pretty easy. What is the t- typical term of, uh, of a superintendent in a park like Gettysburg, time wise? Do you have plans? I'm not aware of it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, unlike the military where they, they move you around, um, in the National Park Service, you, you either get removed <laughs> against your will or you have to apply to a different job or retire. Okay. And so, my plan is not to get removed. <laughs> I'll say Reasonable that Reasonable plan, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I will retire someday. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm actually having a lot of fun. Believe it or not, I am having a tremendous amount of fun. Um, it's a place where I'm continuing to learn, mm-hmm. um, not only about my job, but Civil War, Gettysburg. And I think there's just, it, it's a lifetime of learning in this place, as yes, you all it is know. true. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's really, you know, as far as the term of the superintendent goes, uh, once you get one good, bad, or, or indifferent, you might be stuck with them for a long while. Sorry. We, we happen to know a young okay, man that's well, shooting that, for superintendent. That kind of, um, <laughs> that's right. We, we know somebody who uh, his goal is to uh, to take your job, I guess, when you retire. Um, we should talk. Yeah. Well, he has to get a permanent position yeah. first. <laughs> he has to get into yeah. the... He's got a long way to go, but he thinks he's just going to apply for it. We'll have a talk with him later. He's ambitious. No, he's, okay. Well, I don't know if ambitious is the word, but yeah, okay. we'll, we'll call it that. No, he's a good kid. Uh, but go ahead. Sorry. You were, you were I, was, saying I think we're waiting for Andy's second oh, Andy. part. Yeah, you were going. Go ahead, yeah. Andy. The, the, second, the second part of that, knowing that you've got kind of a um, an indefinite time horizon, do you have an idea of a strategic plan or a five-year plan or some kind of time horizon plan where you've got goals that you want to get after that might not be near-term or short-term goals, but stuff that you're looking at for the, the future development or the, the future efforts that you'd like to see as part of the park? Yeah, that, that is a really excellent question. I, I don't know if my time is indefinite because, uh, you know, we are the federal government. We do need indefinite time, but things move very slowly, mm-hmm. unfortunately. That's why you need indefinite time. I know. Uh, so, you know, I, you know, my primary focus is preservation and protection of this place. Um, that is the key thing that I want to do. But I also have some fiscal realities. Mm-hmm. So um, there's a couple things that I really want to try to get um, moving forward. And I, I don't know how long it's going to take on some of these, but we definitely need to get moving forward. Uh, so one of them is a trails plan. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I think we need to study our trails, where people are going, how people use them, um, what's most uh, efficient and effective for how visitors use the space, learn about this place. Um, we're not going to build trails solely for recreational use, just to get that out of the way. But we do need to take a look at our trail system and how those trail systems might connect with or complement what's happening outside the boundaries of the park. Because uh, for our bicycle riders mm-hmm. out there, um, it can be challenging it riding is. a bike in the park. It's it, you know, and I've done it, and I'm just like, oh, I'd really like to go the wrong way down this road. <laughs> It's uh-huh. key. Better yeah, not break your own rule. It's a state law, folks. <laughs> and I don't have discretionary authority to violate state law. Uh, so I understand that there's there's challenge with trails and getting around the different um, modalities. Uh, the other part of it is uh, preservation and protection of our farmhouses, our farmsteads, if you will. Mm. So the uh, one idea that's out there, if, for those of you that are familiar with the Bushman house, yep. you know, the park had rented that out like an Airbnb style opportunity for the public uh, until I got here. Actually, until COVID got COVID, here. COVID, yeah, that ruined it. Which was when I got here. <laughs> so the so we haven't done that since then. But we have a leasing authority within the National Park Service that I can use. And the leasing authority allows us to lease federal properties um, and the revenues that are generated from that come back to the park mm-hmm. and can be used towards maintenance of that park. So um, we're exploring that idea of potentially getting more farmhouses leased out that the, the Park was managing the Bushmen by themselves, which I thought was insane because, yeah, you got to turn over 
the house every between right. rentals. Yeah. And I had one person doing it who was our administrative officer. And there might have been other people doing it too. Yeah, we had Maria and other people. I mean, there was other people involved. It was crazy because it's like the side collateral duty. And they're like, well, I can't get my normal job done, but now we're renting this thing. Right, out. right. So it was. it just seemed unfair to the staff to do that. So we're looking at leasing. And so we want to get Bushman back out there, potentially Slider, Rose, and Altoff. That'd be awesome. Steve, when you say leasing, you mean like long-term somebody lives in there? Or so, do you mean like a couple nights you could rent it out? Thank you for the clarification or opportunity to clarify. So we would lease it to a property manager. And the property manager would then be the one putting the opportunities um, on Airbnb or wherever okay. to – you know, have that opportunity for the visitor. And, and, you know, I think each one of these houses has such a phenomenal story. Yeah. yeah. We've got photographs. Oh, so yeah. So if you can make that experience integrated into the story. Oh, yeah. I mean, how moving. But do you know how many people would kill to sleep in one of those houses <laughs> oh, just for one night? I would love that. Oh, well, some people think it's really spooky. So, yeah. Uh, but, yeah. yes, you have all these yeah. people that are like, just love it. Um, <laughs> yeah, you get those Which too. is, you know, a unique opportunity it's uh, it provides the opportunity for another way for the public to connect with mm-hmm. this special space, and the, the the most beautiful part about it is the revenues and the the fee that they pay to stay there comes back to the park, so that we can maintain the park. Yeah, that's a great idea because you know a lot of times you go to these parks and they've got old farmhouses and they're just sitting there empty. They don't even do anything interpretive with them. It's just there. So this is a great way because you you know uh, we always hear um, government like agencies talking about, well, we don't have the money in the budget, you know, and it's like all these things we'd like to do and everything. But this is a great way to make, I mean, you're not going to make a fortune, probably not, right? You no, don't think that. It's but it's not would, a fortune, but it's, yeah. it, you know, it may, it may fund the seasonal staff for the maintenance yeah. uh, division. Um, and then, but, but, but people get the experience of sleeping on the ground, not literally on the ground. I mean, unless they go in the backyard and do it, but they get to sleep in the park that they love, yeah. which most of us would love to be able to do that. Yeah. And here's a legal way <laughs> to do it. A, a lot of the farms are actually occupied by employees, though, aren't? It? Is that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So we have... you're going to have a roommate when you when you rent the place. But... <laughs> so it's going to be a phased approach. <laughs> oh, We're not going to kick anybody out of their house. Um, I, I just wasn't sure if I was missing like locations that you were thinking about doing this, or if there was because, like, for example, the Warfield house is not something that I would think you would. There's no utilities. Right. In, right. In that one. Yeah. Um, but I, they're going to missing a floor even. So right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we're on houses real quick. The Klingwall house looks like it's in really uh, rough shape. Let's jump there. Uh, yeah. So, yes, it is. Uh, we just awarded a contract for uh, stabilizing the Klingwall house. So that in the interior of the building, they're going to frame it up to keep it up. Because what happened is uh, we've got moisture that's trapped mm. in the walls of that building. So the latex paint's trapping the, wall, the moisture. Um, and it's you can see it's just falling down. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to stabilize it. And then we're going to continue the design for a rehabilitation and then ultimately rehabilitate. We're probably going to, it's probably going to take another couple of years to get to that point. But the um, the plan is to fix it. Oh, good. And have, hopefully not have a condition again where the, the moisture gets stuck in the walls. <laughs> have you been in it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I was in Musty. it a few years ago. When the I first started, yeah, when I first started doing this, I interviewed the artist in residence that year. And... Um, uh, she was staying there and she's, so I was like, oh, can I see what it looks like inside? She's like, yeah, come in. So I went in and I felt like I was drunk because the floors <laughs> were like uneven and everything. And it's very interesting to walk around in there, but it's so cool to go in there though. I mean, I've not been inside, but even just driving down the road past it, it looks like, I mean, I, I'm not an expert. It looks either like termite damage or water damage. I mean, yeah. the wood just looks like it's rotting. And it is. in my opinion, quickly, yeah. there was like a little hole. Now there's like big right. chunks. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. It's a shame because it's a really cool little house too. So I'm glad you guys are taking care of it, which is your job. That's yeah. <laughs> thank you for the reminder. I mean, how odd. All right, Andy, thank you very much for the call there. And um, oops, come on, drop it. There we go. And Bernard, Bernard, let's talk to Bernard as soon as my computer picks hey, up. Man. Hello, Bernard. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. How about yourself, sir? Pretty good, thank you. What could uh, what could we do for you? Uh, good evening, Superintendent Sims. Glad you're here. My question is about the Little Round Top Rehab Project. Now, when it's complete, are there going to be areas that we're, people we're working on are we're, uh, able to go on prior to the cleanup or upgrade that are going to be off limits then? So, Bernard, where are you going to be when it opens? 
I'm hoping to be there to go. But I mean, I'm talking about like climbing on the stones and climbing in the front and all that stuff. Yeah. So you know, the, there's definitely. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's the worn rock. I mean, it says don't climb this rock, right? Yeah. So we hope people don't climb the rock. Not that one. <laughs> and but we, you know, the intent is to improve these spaces so that you have a a place to go where everyone goes because we've we've made that space, um, you know, safe isn't the right word, but. Uh, available for the visitors and so you know staying on trail is the primary goal um climbing on rocks um may not be what we want you to do because you climb rocks i mean if you're in devil's den i mean i I think the emergency rescue folks had to buy a special apparatus just to extract people from the The rocks rocks. there so we want people to be safe we want to keep people safe we want people to experience these places and uh, you know if you can stay on trail stay on the improved surfaces you're you're part of that preservation mission, and and hopefully you can find that experience that you're looking for. And I know there's a lot of um, stories and a lot of special places uh, that uh, people have traditionally gone. Um, I'm not familiar with all of those, but if you have a question as to where you should go, um, you know, ask. That's that's all I would ask. You know, that way we can have an informed decision on. Oh, you want to go over there? Well, here's a way you can get there. Or we'd really prefer that you don't because there's maybe some sensitivity to that space when um when when it is finished um you're not so you're you're basically asking the public you know if you can avoid it please don't climb on boulders and make your own trails and but you're not like fencing things off or putting do not climb on boulder signs everywhere no correct we're not gonna put any you know we're not gonna plaster things with signs we're not gonna fence things off um you know we just ask the public to be uh, respectful of the place and responsible um, for the place, you know, coming back to, you know, this has to be here forever. Mm-hmm. And one, we want you to be safe, but two, this has to be here. So, you know, don't scratch your initials and things. Don't pick at things. Uh, if you can avoid walking through vegetation to get places, because once you walk there, somebody's behind you and another yeah. person, up, and the next thing you know, we have a social trail. Yeah. And we want to avoid those social trails. So, um, you know, ideally, and at, you probably already know this. You know, we don't have thousands of park rangers out there, you know, watching every everything. Mm-hmm. You know, we expect the public to love this place as they should because mm-hmm. it's your park. And uh, just help us um, keep it for future generations. All right. Uh, Bernard, anything else? Nope. I uh, appreciate it. And thank you. Have a good night. All right. You too. Thank you very much for the call. Um, okay, uh, Cliff McCurley, he is on the phone from California, IA. your uh, home state there, Steve. Welcome, Cliff. <laughs> Hello, it's Cliff. be a good one, I know, already. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, California, born and raised. Where are you from, uh, uh Mr. Tim? Tehachapi. Say what? Do you know where Tehachapi? Tehachapi, no way. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah, no Tehachapi well. So. Nice. And, your, <laughs> but, and yourself? Um, yeah, anyways, we can, uh... Uh, I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area, Pleasanton, California. Yes, named after General Alfred Pleasanton of Gettysburg. Beautiful or spot. In, I don't know what you call it. Yep. Um, but hey, uh, so my question has to do with the dastardly corn. Um, oh, was just there a couple of weeks ago, and that's, um, you know, it seems like most of the time I go there, it's like this infernal 10-foot-tall seed <laughs> corn. And I don't know if there's like... Uh, you know, stipulations. I know there's contracts with the local farmers and certainly don't want to have them lose out on anything. But, you know, is there, I mean, has there ever been that kind of discussion about maybe saying, hey, you guys can plant whatever you want here as long as it's not like 10 feet tall? Cause, you know, it's uh, it's the resource. And when I go there in a lot of parts of the battlefield, even just a couple of weeks ago, it was like, well, uh, I can get the same experience with the Lano book in my living room right now, but I just can't see anything. That's why you got to come so, in the winter time, uh, Cliff. You can your... see a lot more of the lay of the land in the winter. Can I? Can I? Oh, uh, that's my next trip. That's for sure. Yeah, Cliff. Uh, let me um, add a question to yours so that he can answer them all together. Okay. Um, sure. So your yep. question yep. is about the corn and everything. Uh, I get a lot of people that ask, does the Park Service plant this? And then I tell them, no, it's leased to farmers. But that that's how it works, right? Is yeah. It's leased to farmers. You guys don't have any say over what they plant. I mean, it can't be anything illegal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can't be that, anything uh, illegal. So, you know, we, yes, there's over 1,500 acres in the park that are leased to farmers for agricultural uses. So everything from the corn to the soy to wheat Sorghum, Sorghum. 
uh, rye. Alfalfa yeah. a couple of years ago I saw. And um, he was like, hey. I oh, forget it. I was making a three, little, what was Good, that, I'm little sorry, rascals little joke? <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. My God. <laughs> and so, Cliff, first of all, say you're right. You're right about the corn. You're right about uh, its impact to the ability to, to view the battlefield, the view shed. Yeah, you, know, you can. Yeah, you know, you know, we don't want to create a corn maze around here, but we do need to be sensitive to the farmers and the, you know the the economics of farming, which I know nothing about. Uh, but I, I so I want to be respectful to you know the challenges that farmers have. But that is something that is on our list that we're going to look at: is can we work with these farmers to identify spaces where maybe corn may not be appropriate? Can we limit the height of what they're planting there? Um, because it's it, you know it goes to um, having balance. The Park Service doesn't have enough staff to manage all of this acreage, so that's one of the reasons we lease it. So it's mm-hmm. a good partnership with the the community. So we want to be sensitive to that and see where we can make some progress. Um, I can't promise you quick progress on this, Cliff, or everybody out there listening. But right, it is right. a known issue. It is it has been brought up. Our license guides. Um, mention it to us as well. So yes, we're going to take a look at that. We're going to see what we can do. Um, point well made, um, duly noted. <laughs> Very good, uh, Cliff. Thank you. Anything else, Cliff? Well, appreciate your time. No, that's it, buddy. Uh, yeah, you guys take care. All right, you too. Talk to you later. Um, before we uh, move on to the other callers, we've got a few more callers. The number is 717-420-1978. Uh, we're going to try to finish by 830 because we also have the Addressing Gettysburg Book Club that has uh, Bill Stiple on at 830. So we want to give people the opportunity to uh, do that because we do have a lot of people in the club there. Uh, so a couple more people we can get calling in if you want to call in. Um, Steve, you've mentioned a couple times we don't have enough uh, law enforcement, maintenance, whatever it may be. Um, volunteers, uh, the, the uh, what was it called? Adopt a position mm-hmm. is gone for now, but possibly coming back. Yeah. So let me first say uh, the official stance is we have enough resources. Okay. So, okay, but speaking gotcha. of volunteers, <laughs> uh, the uh, yes, the adopt a position program. Uh, so when I got here, we had a, a an employee that was managing that program. Um, I didn't know what it was, but you know, probably within a month or two, that <laughs> gentleman left. Oh, yeah, he left. And then I started talking to the supervisor and some of the other staff, and they're like, "Yeah, we can never keep anybody in this position. It's a six month position, and mm. you know, people want more than six months of work." I know a guy who might take it though. And uh, <laughs> so that was one issue. Uh, the second issue was um, it was a lot of touching, and what I mean by touching is that we had hundreds of groups, individual groups with their special place to come and volunteer, which I, is is wonderful. They have a connection. They have a place they want to spend their time and, and give to the park, which is wonderful. But it was hugely administratively burdensome. Okay. Um, so that was an issue. And so we've been evaluating this, uh, and we are moving more in a direction of concentrated volunteer days. Okay. And so, like you did yeah. at, on National Public Lands Day, mm-hmm. you know, we had, I don't know, it was 20, 30 people out there. Something like that, yeah, yeah. And made a huge impact in four, four hours. Yeah. And we think that's a good model where we can say, hey, National Public Lands Day, and, and this time is just one project, but maybe in the future we can have two, three, four. We've got staff out there, we resource it, and we've got now 300 people out there making a huge impact in a very short amount of time. It's efficient for the park and effective for us because as our staff shrinks, it's less staff to manage volunteers. Uh Uh, So we think that's going to be an effective process that doesn't preclude our supervisors and our division chiefs um, from engaging with people that have, you know, a special passion. So if if somebody wants to go and clear the weeds out of Devil's Den and that's all they want to do and it's one or two people, you know, Contact the staff. I think on your website you got a link to Randy Hill. Do we still? I, I do. Yeah, you do. I checked. <laughs> oh, okay. It, it works. Uh, <laughs> you know that. You know. I'm sorry, Randy. You're going to get a thousand emails. <laughs> but uh, you know, reach out. We'll see what we can do. Uh, what I want to do is, you know, Randy is phenomenal and does a ton of things. He doesn't have a lot of time to supervise volunteers, and that's the thing we want to do is make sure our volunteers are resourced know what they need to do, know our rules. Yeah. Yeah, because we have lots of rules. Sure. Just do. 
uh, so that we can work together to achieve the park's goal of maintaining these spaces. And your goal, too, because you love this place. Right. So we want to, again, move back to, not move back, move towards more of concentrated times, National Trails Day, National Public Lands Day. Maybe there's some other dates out there. I know the Fa Gaysburg Foundation has you know, their days, their volunteer days as well, which are highly eff effective and impactful. Um, and I think that's just more efficient for us for where we're at with, with staffing and the ability to manage all those volunteers. And that may not work well with a lot, but give us a chance to test it sure, out. Sure, sure. You got to try and it. If, it. if it doesn't, if the belly flops, then, hey, I'll eat my words and we'll try it <laughs> something else. Uh, so are you saying then if, like, uh, I decide next year um, when we do our, our get out of the car tours in, say, October, um, if I contacted the park and said, I'd like to you know, offer people the opportunity to volunteer to clean up a section. We're doing a tour in this area. Anything that you need done? Because after the tour, we'll do it. Is that possible? Reach yeah, reach out. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, well, I don't, that's cool. I don't want to preclude people from asking. Yeah. But I, I, I want to strike a balance of um, a huge administrative burden because for everyone that volunteers, I need a piece of paper because if you get injured, it's a, it's sure we're responsible. Yeah. And also, I want to make sure the liability piece is covered, uh, that my legal policy requirements are covered for mm -hmm. volunteers. And that's that's hugely administrative. So concentrating it allows us to get all that done in a little bit more efficient manner. Okay, that's good. That's good. All right, uh, let's go to, uh, I think this is Charlie. Charlie, you're on the air. Well, you beat me to the punch, guys. Uh, <laughs> My organization has been volunteering at the National Park since two, 2001 in the adopt a position program. Very um, good. One of the areas to take care of is up at Culp's Hill. Before we started, nobody even knew it was there. Um, you know, so I, I guess my question was going to be what are the future plans for the program was going to be reinstated, but I guess you answered that. Was it satisfactory answer, Charlie, or do you have some uh, advice for me? Well, not necessarily the one I wanted to hear. I mean, you know, we've got half a dozen people that travel from Wisconsin out to Gettysburg once, twice a year to clean the area out. And we'd like to continue doing that. It's part of our service to history. From Wisconsin, you're saying? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. See, people love this from all over the country. Yeah. Well, thank you, Charlie. Really appreciate uh, your dedication and your volunteerism towards the park. Um, we're going to continue to work on it because I don't want to lose your support of the park. I think, Steve, what you might need is to bring me on as a special liaison or czar of some some kind of fancy title, and um, where I can help you guys um, corral and orchestrate all of these volunteers, because there's so many people that really, I mean, we talked about this, and, and you get it. You, I remember you saying you were, uh, when you first came here, like it wasn't, people aren't this way back at Valley Forge, or aren't as much in love with Valley Forge as they are here. As Something engaged. to that. Huh? As engaged, maybe. En engaged, that's a good word. And um, the, people really, really, they will come from Wisconsin yeah. come to from all clean over the up. World. I know they do, but I yeah. mean, this guy's from Wisconsin. Yeah. So, you know, um, there's got to be something. Yeah. I know, I know Matt's joking a little bit about the czar thing, but no, I'm not. Would you ever consider something like a volunteer position that would handle that? Oh uh, yes, let me preface this with kind of what I was talking about. When I lived in Pittsburgh, I was part of the Civil War Roundtable, Greater Greater Pittsburgh Civil War Roundtable. Our adopt a position was the 155th Pennsylvania up on Culps, or, uh, I'm sorry, on Little Round Top. Fairly big plot of land with some overgrowth and things like that. But in the spring and in the fall, we would come out for a weekend of service. Um, we would normally get a tour from either a park ranger or a licensed battlefield guide one day, have dinner together, and then the next day, or the vice versa, we would clean and then have a tour or have the tour and then clean the next day. And I know that group took it pretty darn hard. I mean, there were, you know, consistently 20, 30, 40 people. But my experience was we showed up, one of the park staff came, unloaded equipment, gave a piece of paper with a clipboard to mm -hmm. our group and left. So yeah. we were responsible for signing the waiver ourselves, and then we were responsible for cleaning and then leaving the equipment there, and then it was picked up. I can't imagine that's the best way possibly to do it, to avoid liability or whatever, but I just wonder if, you know, you have Park Watch volunteers, you have other folks that are really invested in local, um, mm -hmm. you know, volunteerism. I wonder if maybe somebody like that would spearhead or... or yeah, you know, I, I don't know, just spitballing I a little appreciate bit. Appreciate that. Yeah, that's kind of what I was talking. We're about. We're gonna continue to chew on this one. Yeah. Yeah. It's not fully baked. 
So, I, but yeah, I see, and, and that's I like that. I like answers like that because yeah. it's it's not like no, it's my way or the highway. It's like, well, no, we're going to think about it, and we'll take your input, and we'll consider everything, and that's that's nice. It's refreshing, frankly. Yeah. I must say, Charlie, thank you for the call. And thank you for volunteering all the way from Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's what we do. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and we got another Charlie, but this Charlie goes by Chuck, apparently. Um, go ahead, Chuck. You're on the air. Oh, thanks. Uh, Superintendent Sims, thanks for being on the program. Um, and, and my question is about the Confederate monuments on West Confederate Avenue. Um, I, I hope they don't go away, but are there any plans to, or any thoughts about uh, some additional re uh, signage, reinterpreting some of those monuments that were placed there? Yeah. So, you know, first of all, there, uh, as far as I know, there's no plans to take them away. Uh, it would take an act of Congress. Um, so not within my authority. My, my, uh, my charge here is to protect them, interpret mm -hmm. them until, uh, until the big boss says otherwise. So, you know, as far as the interpretation of the Confederate monuments, you know, the, the one thing I'll say is that if you go to our website, we have scanned a lot of documentation on the establishment of these, of the 13 state Confederate monuments. So I think there's, it provides that opportunity for the public to do their own research, come mm -hmm. up with their own thoughts and conclusions or um, understanding of these Confederate monuments. Because I think the, the topic is just complex. Oh, yeah. It's very complex. And, you know, at one point, we were looking at providing a contextual wayside at every um, Confederate state monument. And, and we're kind of pulling back from that uh, because you basically ended up with 13 waysides that said the same thing. Mm. So the, um, the approach that we're contemplating right now is putting a wayside at the Virginia Monument. Okay provide some contextualization, some information, give people an opportunity to, to think about it. You know, and that's what we want to do. We want to provoke thought. We don't want to tell you how to think or what to think. We just want to provoke thought. And so that's... Um, also refreshing. Just beginning to get the ingredients together so it's not even in the oven to be sure. start being baked. Um, so we're just now um, talking about that and how we can provide something there because that's a very popular spot. Is this the first time you're saying this publicly that they're doing that? Absolutely. So you haven't heard any flack from that for even just doing that? <laughs> um, well, no, this is the first time that, you know, yeah. what I'm saying now is where our thoughts are and uh, the direction where we're thinking of, of going. So, okay. yeah, if, if you have some feedback for that <laughs> on that for me, um, I'm happy to listen because, uh, you know, again, uh, we just want to provide the visitor with context. Right. And the opportunity to learn. I think that's a great idea. You got to have something else there to explain the rest of the story, you know, uh, especially I, in this day and age. Go I'll ahead, personally Ronnie. throw out a kudos to your chief of interpretation, Chris Gwynn. Mm -hmm. He's awesome. Uh, he's pretty darn awesome. God, he he's awesome. Is, he yeah, really yeah. is. He really is. And um, the More History, hashtag More History Initiative, they, yeah. they're spearheading with Dr. Hancock. Uh, I think that's important. I you do know, too. When everybody's saying, oh, erasing this and canceling that. You know, there's there's always more to the story of, you know, for example, how the monuments got placed, who dedicated them, mm -hmm. when were they placed, and what context were they placed. And I think all that's important to have a, a, a full understanding of the significance of the monumentation on both sides of yeah. the battlefield. Not enough Americans listen to Paul Harvey because they would know that every story has the rest of the story. <laughs> so, yeah. But, yeah, you're, I think we're very fortunate to have Chris here. Oh, he's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and all the staff. I'm going to toot sure. the horn of all sure. the staff. Of I mean, course. Chris Quinn yeah. is phenomenal, but um, this is the best staff. We say it all I've the time. Worked with. Yeah. We say that the, you know, we don't get to work with the whole staff. We only interact with the interpretive staff. And every, every one of them is fantastic. Yeah. Every one of them. Yeah. Not, I, not one is boring. Every, they're all engaging. They, they know they're friendly. I mean, they're great. They really are great. It, they're passionate, yeah. You know, and and there's visitors that are passionate. The staff is passionate. Mm -hmm. They love this place, and they pour their heart out into this place. Yeah, it's and, contagious. Uh, it's, it is. Yeah. It's a lovely place to work, and I'm I'm just honored to be here. I really yeah. am. I I don't blame you, Chuck. Thank you very much for the call. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, Sean Sean Gentile. I can't tell. It's kind of all messed up, but uh, oh, let me press talk here so that we can hear you. And as soon as it goes, okay, here you go. Sean, are you on the air? 
Hey, yeah, John. John. Gentile. John. What's going on? Gentile. Okay, thank uh, you very much. Oh, we just became friends on Facebook today. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, I live in Fairfax, Virginia. Superintendent, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, quite the Q and A has been great. I hope this is the first of many. So thanks. Me too. Me um, too. There have been rumors about a long-term plan, even if it's in the conversation, the discussion phase. Uh, that would make Gettysburg a driving only park or even that only buses would be allowed on the battlefield oh. and, you know, tickets would be required. Would you speak to us any specifically to that issue or if anything like that's under consideration? Great question. John, thank you very much. John, I think that's 100 percent rumor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm glad that's so the answer things. I wanted. I, I'm good. <laughs> Nothing to it. So, but I will say, there's always a but, right? <laughs> uh, we are uh, engaging with transportation folks to evaluate transportation. Yeah, we have lots of use of the park avenues, conflicting use of the avenues. There are no proposed solutions to that, but um, I think we're probably five years away from any kind of proposed solution. That'd be my guess. So. As of today, there's no talk of driving only in the park. I mean, right. I think you got to get out on your feet. I in this agree. Park. I agree. You got to see it. You got to feel it. Yes, you do. You got to smell the air. You got to have the wind blow through your hair if you've got it. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Don't worry. I have enough for both of us. <laughs> it's, you know, I, again, it goes back to. People connect differently to these resources, <laughs> yes. and, and we need to be able to provide everyone the opportunity to find their connection. Okay. <laughs> uh, is this uh, Jeremy? Hello. 540, you're on the air. Hey, Casey Turbin. How's it going, buddy? Oh, Casey <laughs> Turbin. Man, this it says, Jeremy, it's mom. Jeremy's hey, Peter, been calling for the call. last. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to ask the uh, superintendent, how he suggests the petition, what's the best way? He mentioned earlier in the show that, you know, he does, he's kind of held by Congress. He's saying that if we do have suggestions, do we send him letters? Do we talk to a congressperson in Virginia for from here? But, you know, what's his best way to do he suggests for us to make suggestions and even, you know, petition Congress or, or his uh, or people above him? For, for what? For change. You know, he, he said that, you know, when he says, you know, we're worried that they, they want to uh, shut down the parks, the buses only. How do we say, hey, we don't want oh. this to happen? Do we send him a thousand letters? Things like that. Shoot me an Whenever email. To say. Just email me. So go to you directly. Just so. go to me. Yep. Okay. Email me. Good. Yeah. And, uh, Very good. What is my email? <laughs> <laughs> I can look it up. <laughs> oh, so if you I... go on our website, I think it's like superintendent I've got it. Hold on. G -E -T -T at mps.gov. I have, uh, let's see here. Or G-E-T-T -T underscore superintendent at mps.gov. What's one of those two? It is Stephen underscore Sims oh, at nps.gov. Well, that's my direct email. Oh, what did you say? Oh, shut Now up. it's too late. No, it's okay. <laughs> oh, um, I'm, so, I'm sorry. That was perfectly fine. The, the reason I sent the, you know, gave you that other one is because Jeez. it goes to my communication specialist. Because not every question needs to come to me. I've got experts. Oh, and yeah. he would send it to the experts. Okay. So, so don't, if it comes to me, it might be delayed. That That's fine. Mm, I'm sorry. I didn't realize there was like a general catch-all It's email. all good. <laughs> I'm, not try, I'm not trying to hide anything. You want to email me, email me. Well, yeah, I know. I understand that. But, it, you're, you know, hopefully you're not going to get flooded with inane <laughs> questions now. Not that Casey asked us an inane question, but you never know what uh, listeners might do. Anyway, anything else, Case? No, very good. Just wanted to, you know, resummarize. If, if we have questions, concerns, there's to the man. Uh, we appreciate that. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. Absolutely, Mr. we do. Thank you, Casey. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Debbie Jones, little Debbie, you're on the air. Hello. 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 Hi. Um, thank you again, Superintendent Sims, for doing this. Um, we all really appreciate it, I'm sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, my, uh -huh. my, uh, my question is kind of similar to the earlier Roundtop question. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of social trails created up there. Um, and they kind of suggest that because they're there, the places they go to are places people want to see. Mm -hmm. So with the rehabilitation project, obviously the erosion needs to stop. I mean, from being up there, it's clear 
that's a problem that needs to be fixed. So with the project, are some of those social trails going to be paved so that people can still get to those places that are important to them, but that erosion can be kind of, you know, stopped in its tracks? And yeah. I'm from Michigan, so my, my first thought is the 16th Michigan Monument. Like, if you can get down to it, you can turn around and see how bad that erosion is. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a slippery rock to get there. But we still want to be there. able to get to it. <laughs> Yeah, it's an excellent question, and uh, I believe on our website you'll see the renderings of where the, um, I'll say, the formalized trails system is going to be, and there should be access to every monument and marker on the round top. So the, the, okay. the theory here is the visitor has access to those key places um, that they should be visiting, and if there's not a trail there, there's probably a reason. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Debbie? It does. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for calling in. We'll uh, talk to you next time. Call in more often. Um, All right. Uh, Is this Steve or is he just saying our guest's name? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Steve, you're on the air. Hey, how you guys doing tonight? Good. How are you? I'm good. Um, yeah, I had a specific question regarding the anniversary battle walks that have been taking place for, you know, over 20 years. And over the last couple of years, everything's changed to where now we actually aren't walking out on the ground. We're not getting these interpretive, more detailed battle walks with the seasoned rangers. Um, I've heard a lot of, you know, kind of negative stuff from actual rangers saying, yeah, we're kind of being told we got to kind of stay on this quote unquote trail and they don't have these programs anymore. So my first question was just, you know, what exactly is going on with that? And, you know, this, this whole park, this is our land. It's not yours. Not, you know, there's not a thing you can't go out in this field. That's the whole point why this place is so beautiful. So I'd just like to know if they're going to bring back the actual anniversary battle walk that, you know, really special to hundreds of people every year that got to go on these special programs. Yeah, great question. So for the uh, the anniversary battle walks, I mean, those walks are developed by our interpretive staff. We mentioned Chris Gwynn and his staff earlier, and they they are phenomenal, as you well know. So if they have a battle walk where they want to get to a specific place because they have a specific story or point that they need to make, um, two things. One, is there a trail that goes there already, a mode path, if you will? Mm-hmm. And if there's not then we'll evaluate whether or not we need to create a new path. You know, is it compelling enough that we need to create a new path to that space? Or is there an agricultural lease to a farmer who's now going to lose part of their crop because now we've got 300 people walking in that space? So we want to balance preservation and protection with visitation. And so that that is the approach. Um, it doesn't specifically answer your question because we'd have to specifically see what the the battle walk is or what that story or what that um, day of the battle they're trying to talk about or that whatever that story is. Yeah. That we'll have to evaluate it independently. or So once. in other words, you're, you're saying that the, the ranger was saying we can't go on the fields maybe because there was a crop growing there? A crop growing there or they wanted to take a fence down <laughs> to get through there. You know, the, the rangers need to comply with the same yeah, rules so- as the public. Uh-huh. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, and I was just going to say, uh, you know, I, I've, I've known a lot of the Rangers, a lot of them, too, that are now retired, and I was through all the glory years of Hartwig and John Heiser, and, you know, it was always important. You walk the ground that that specific regiment or brigade that we might be doing, and that is specifically told to me by many colleagues of yours, and it's not just like a rumor mill thing, and we all kind of see it firsthand the last few years. We're like, what's going on? You know, all of a sudden there's this, there's a go to one spot, you stand there, and it's kind of more generalized sense when it was a more detailed. That was really important. And I guess for time purposes, I was on Hartwig's big walk when the Harmon Farm property got bought by the trust and given to the battlefield. And his biggest thing was, look, this is the monument, this ground, this is your ground. You can walk anywhere you want to. It's the footsteps of these men, it's the interpret the property, get out of the car, get out there. So my next question, just for, again, for time's sake, is, since that was done, we were all excited. Nothing's been done over there. It's just golf cart paths. And I just wonder, I mean, that's been however many years when we got that property. And it's like, wow, it gets to the government and then nothing's done. It's just grown out. You know, there's no interpretation going over there. It's really hard to get out to that spot. So I'd like to know 
if there's any final update or something we can actually get out to that important piece of ground. Yeah, great question. It is an important piece of ground. And what we're doing is we're putting together what we call a cultural landscape report. And so we're going to evaluate it, um, its history, its, uh, you know, what's significant about it, you know, its integrity, um, you know, what are those aspects of that space um, that we need to be paying attention to as we move into a design phase to design the rehabilitation of that space. So we're, we haven't finished the planning yet. Um, so that's been something that's uh, been ongoing. And then once we finish that, I'll have to compete for project dollars to do the design. Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, another process. So um, I have no guarantees I'm going to get design money or construction money, but that is something I'll continue to work towards and also working with our partners with the Gaysburg Foundation and, and seeing if that's one of our top priorities that we want them to focus on and assist us with. The, uh, when did the park acquire that land? Yeah, I don't know. It was before. It was long it's before been you got here. Twenty years. It's 2011, yeah, it's maybe. Yeah, it's been. A long okay, so a, a decade or so. Um, and so, and then you, when you came in here, like you had pointed out early on in the show, that we had to, what, a couple of uh, temporary superintendents. Yeah. And a, and I think that time where we had those temporary superintendents, we lost time in things that started before they were there um, because they just didn't move the ball forward at all. So now you're kind of playing catch up and also doing what is required today to keep the park going. So you're like catching up from the past and so you got a lot, I wouldn't want your job. It's, <laughs> it, you have a lot on your plate. Like when you got here, you have a lot on your plate and then you got to deal with people like us. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, there's a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll concede. Uh, but it's an honor yeah. to do all this. And, you know, I, I do want to say in that rotating superintendent time period, their job isn't to create vision. Right. Their job is just just keep it going. Mm -hmm. You're only here for a temporary bit of time. We don't want you creating new things, changing direction or anything. Just, you know, keep the boat steady. Right. So I don't blame any of those rotating No, no, no. I'm not trying to blame them. I'm just saying. It's, it's just a fact. We lost time. And... Yeah. Um, so it's hard to catch up because, you know, we're already limited on how much we can do in, in a certain amount of time. Yeah. Um, but we have a lot to do. And I think that's the part of the fun is that I, I don't see an end to the job. It's, there's always going to be something to preserve, something mm -hmm. to protect, something to improve, something to change. And I know change is hard, but mm -hmm. it's... Um, it's an exciting place. It's not a place where you're going to get bored. But how about this, uh, Steve's point about, uh, you know, it, it, at one point the the message from the park was get out there, get into the land, feel the topography under your feet, you know, see what it's like to stand out in the middle of that field and look at the seminary or whatever. And, and, and now it's kind of, it seems like that message is changing to, well, keep your distance. I think it's a balance. Yeah. And, you know, back to the National Park Service mission of preserving and protecting in perpetuity. And if, if we're going to bring 300 people on a, a four-hour battle walk into a space, that's going to have an impact. The feet on right. that space is going to have an impact. And there are things in that soil still. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure that we preserve and protect it. We don't want compaction. We don't want erosion. Look what happened to Little Round Top. So if we encourage these things, especially in, in battle anniversary type style things, and you're certainly going to have lots of erosion and problems. Um, but if, if you alone are going out there and there's no fence or anything out there and you want to walk across the field and get your your fill of ticks, <laughs> then I don't think anybody's going to stop you because so they don't want the ticks either. <laughs> uh, but we'd prefer that you stay on the trail. But it's, so it's really about large groups that you're talking about with that stuff where we we'll need to be a little more careful. We certainly manage our own programs. We manage our commercial use. Yeah. We manage our permittees. Um, but the individuals that are out there, and I see them all the time as I'm driving out there, they're all over the place. And I'm like, wow, I hope yeah. we got bug spray on or something. <laughs> Are careful. You know, there's there's rocks and there's snakes and there's wetlands and stuff. But we honestly, you know, it's you know, the Park Service mission to preserve and protect this in perpetuity. The best way to do that is to help us by staying on trail. It really is. All right. All right. Very good. Steve, uh, anything else, Steve? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just would add that the anniversary battle walks were once a year. And, again, I just go back to Scott Hartwig. These, these programs all the way back to Gregory Coco for 30 years. 
we've been doing these walks, and it's not like that's happening every day, 300 people walking over the same spot. I'm not talking about up on Little Round Top with thousands of tourists walking over the same little spot there. I'm talking about if I want to walk Clark Sales Mississippi in charge on a battle walk specifically to a regiment, that was a really special thing because you're really there in a more detailed way with that regiment and hundreds of people showed up for that and looked forward to it. And I'm just telling, I think I could speak for a lot of people, yeah. not just a handful of hardcores that, yeah, it's been very disappointing. So, um, you know, I just, I don't see an erosion thing of walking across that field on an anniversary program. I think that was a special thing that we all met. We loved for, you know, decades and we hope to get back once, you know, I guess get back to, well, okay. Gotcha. I got you, Steve. Thank you very much for the call. How about that the point, though, that the, these uh, walks that he's talking about, these big group events and everything, they're not every day, and they're not going over heavily trodden uh, ground like Little Round Top. Trodden? Trod? Um, ground like Little Round yeah. Top. You know, they're going out in a field that nobody really ever goes to. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate the question, and it's something we'll continue to look at. But, you know, if my rangers are allowed to do it, then the commercial use authoriza- uh, authorizations and those permit holders are authorized to do it too. Right. The other permit holders are authorized to do it too. And next thing you know, it's not just the yeah. battle walk. Yeah, it's everybody. Okay, I see what you're saying. All right, so we got four more calls. Uh, area code 304, you're the last one. Uh, right now, though, we're going to go to, oh, the great American songwriter Don McLean. <laughs> Don McLean, you're on the air. Hey, guys. Um I don't know if you talked about this yet. I just got out of the recording booth with my friend Barry Manilow, so <laughs> I, I apologize. Uh, Steve, you know me as Don from the Dayton, Ohio area, so hopefully you'll make that connection. But I've spent a lot of time here in Ohio defending the National Park Service in Gettysburg, um, especially for the little round top uh, rehabilitation and the timing of that. So I was wondering if you haven't already, could you talk a little bit about the budgeting system and how that encumbers uh, planning. And, you know, it's, it's all about timing. It's all about uh, making sure that things happen, you know, different appropriations. I don't know if this is making sense to you, but can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit? What an exciting topic. Thank you, Don. <laughs> how much time do we have? Yeah, really. For 30 seconds. <laughs> so, Don, appreciate the question. Uh, there's probably, let me count, one, two, three, four maybe five different, I'll call them colors of money that have been involved in um, the Little Round Top project, everything from design to construction. And so um, some of those colors of money is a a specific request and um, I have to compete for that money. Uh, Some of that money is donated money. And so it all has to kind of come together at the right time in the right amount um, to move that forward. So it's, you know, having a project that started and then stopped and then start it again. It's it's tough because some of this money has an expiration date too. Mm. Yeah. Oh and, yeah. So go into that a little bit so that people understand because I don't think people get that. Oh boy. Uh, again, how much time do we have? <laughs> Very uh, briefly. So, if they want to know more, they can call and email you. Or something. Yeah. Fortunately, <laughs> uh, we've got for the construction. We have what they call. There's three different colors of money for the construction. There's Helium Act money, and Helium Act uh, requires a non-federal match. So the donated monies get matched one for one with Helium Act money. Uh, and then we have federal highways money too. So all the roadway work that you see up there is being paid for out of a federal highway bucket. Uh, the design piece, I think we had some what they call cyclic and repair rehab funds that funded the design piece. Those funds have two-year life cycles. Okay. Don? Well, so the point is money has a time period behind it and um, the government's not, not a very efficient organization, and it just takes um, all the timing and has to line up with the funding. So that explains a lot of this is out of the control of the Park Service. Would you agree? It's a mixed bag, I would say. Um, some of it is just the process, and uh, the process is what it is. And once we start it, we kn- kind of know where we're going to land. Um, and some of it's the federal appropriation process. So it's, you know, I, I think if I were to start this one over from scratch, um, it probably wouldn't have taken as long, not to say it wouldn't have taken long, but I think the, um, <coughs> where am I going with this? It just takes a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And that's, that's the point I wanted to bring out. Yeah. Thank you, Don. That's all I got. All right, Don. 
Thank you very much. Bye bye, Mr. American Pie. Um, all right, we've got Matt Kelly on the phone. I think it's uh, yeah, Matt. Uh, you're on the air. Hey guys, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for taking the call. You're welcome. Long time Gettysburg guy. I just wanted to ask the superintendent. Um, as a kid going there since 1981, I always look forward to going there at after dark too. And I understand there's short staffing and vandalism and stuff like that. But is there any chance of possibly the park being open after dark ever again for a few hours or certain parts of the year? This is a question near and dear to my heart, <laughs> as Steve knows. It only took us an hour and a half to get here. <laughs> I'm surprised. I almost started with it, but I said, let's go with the beavers. <laughs> Matt, thank you for the question. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really three um, reasons for the change in the park hours. Uh, one is safety. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's no lights in the park. Um, as you're probably well aware, you know, there's areas that, you know, aren't that safe um, when you're out there in the dark, especially if there's no moon. Uh, liability. The park's liability. Somebody gets injured out there. That's It's a tort claim. It's a par- potential liability to the National Park Service. And then staffing. You know, I only have so many s- staff members, uh, especially law enforcement, who are absolutely superb at what they do. Um, but I only have so many. And so, you know, if there's an emergency response um, that's needed or um, just patrolling in general, you know, I have limited staffing. And so for safety and liability reasons and staffing reasons, it made sense to change the hours to, you know, sunset or, you know, sunrise to sunset um, as far as when the park's open, plus 30 minutes on each end. So for our photographers and those that like those sunrises and sunsets, you have that opportunity. Um, and we're we're in alignment with other parks as well because mm-hmm. um, we did that research. So that's the reason. It, what time do, does Park Watch isn't out there all night, right? They stop at a certain time. Uh, I can't disclose their schedule. Okay. <laughs> the it does, doesn't it? Okay. Well, I guess my question is, if we have Park Watch out there, and maybe, again, we, we put out a call for more volunteers to join Park Watch, could we not at least during the summer go back to 10 o'clock? I mean, it may be a personal favor to me. <laughs> Matt, I will consider it. Thank you. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> you don't mind me. If you don't mind me adding, I'm a cop from New Jersey, and I'll gladly help out in the summertime. There you go. So you got a volunteer cop right there. What happens? He'll bring when his the billy club. There you go. And we don't other. volunteer too often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. The park rush will start uh, arresting each other. That's not. You don't want that. I'll tell you another thing that's related to the park hours. That's a staffing issue. So I had staff going out and changing every sign, yeah. twice a year, on the park hours. Yeah. You, well, I, I got a solution to that. The bottom always. There's a little hook on the bottom, and you just change the hours, and it's a little, own little sign. And you just hang it on there. <laughs> it go missing. Yeah. 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 Park yeah. open for no, no, no. We'll have it very secure. <laughs> so it's it's highly I'll unlikely we'll signs. go back. Okay. It's highly oh. unlikely we'll go back, but I'll okay. consider it. Okay. I mean, just for like a couple months, you know, June through August. I hear you. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's beautiful. It's beautiful out there at night, Matt. We'll I'll keep working on them from here. You send them emails, okay? <laughs> yeah, Please no, do. I'll send you both it. emails that we're giving. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your service, sir. Um, all right, Beth. Beth is on next, and then we're getting to our final call after that. Uh, Beth, go ahead. You're on the air. I thank you, Superintendent Sims, for coming on. I wanted to ask. Um, you took a lot of flack last December with the Sergeant Mack Foundation with not allowing the um, them to put the wreaths on the graves. And even this year, there was a not-so-flattering article in the Gettysburg paper. Would you ever think about, one, possibly letting them do it again, maybe next year, or partnering with something like Wreaths Across America? Beth, I really, really appreciate the question. I honestly do. And um, I'm actually surprised this one didn't come up earlier, too. Yeah. This is a hot button. I'm also surprised that I forgot to put it on my agenda (laughs) because it's the one to ask you about. Go ahead. Good good question, Beth. I I want to explain this one because it's very important. Uh, So I I think let's go back to July 4th, 2020. Okay. So July 4th, 2020, we had a fake Antifa 
post. So, something happened here something? on July 4th, 2020? 2020. I don't know. I don't know uh, what that oh, would be. So this <laughs> social media post about a flag burning in the National Cemetery created a movement yep. Face of painting. people. Yep. And so we had a lot of people come to the park to protect their park. Um, a lot of them armed. Oh. Uh, a lot of them uh, in the National Cemetery. Um, and let me just, as an aside, I want to say, I want to thank my law enforcement, uh, as well as the community of law enforcement officers, mm. uh, Cumberland Township, the borough, state police. I think we even had, um, uh, yeah, Department of Homeland Security was here. I mean, there's, and, I, and I'm not naming them all, so I apologize, but the law enforcement community were stellar. Yeah. They were fantastic. And like everybody was here. And, and they did a superb job and their job was to, um, make sure people stayed safe and that there was no damage to federal property. They achieved both of those objectives. Yeah. So from that, it was a success in managing that movement because the, the rules and regulations and laws about First Amendment demonstrations and moving them into special spaces for that, I don't think contemplated this kind of movement. And so we managed it to keep people safe and keep property safe. So after that July 4th, 2020 uh, activity, um, I got a lot of complaints. Yeah about what happened in the National Cemetery specifically. So the park, myself and my staff started looking into National Cemetery regulations. It's a different regulation than what we use to manage the park, the rest of the park. And so we worked with our regional office, our Washington office, we had conversations and we reviewed the regulation and what we were doing and we recognized that we were allowing things in the National Cemetery that are prohibited. Mm. So uh, 36 CFR part 12.4 says special events are prohibited in the National Cemetery, except for Memorial Day, Veterans Day, and other dates designated by the superintendent as having both commemorative and historic significance to that National Cemetery. So we reviewed everything that was happening in there. Uh, we had the Masons having an event. Um, so we talked with them and they're no longer having their event in the National Cemetery. We talked to the college, and uh, the college worked with us. And this year, um, they made the change, and they went to Meade's headquarters and had their event. But the students still were able to walk through the National Cemetery and have that experience. Right. With the freshmen you're talking freshmen, about. Yeah. The first year mm -hmm. walk. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talked to the Sergeant Mack Foundation, um, they were less receptive and s still wanted to have their event. Now, we said this wreaths. And here's a key fact, fact. Wreaths were always allowed. We never said no to the wreaths. Wreaths are covered under part 12.10 mm -hmm. as a floral tribute. So the box trucks in the National Cemetery and the unloading and putting the wreaths out were, were always going to be approved. It was just the ceremony. Right. The ceremony piece, we said, you know, this, this event is not historic to this National Cemetery or commemorative to this National Cemetery. It's important. It's, it's important. Uh, you know, their, their cause is just. Sure. Is, there's nothing wrong with it. It's is a beautiful thing that, what, uh, that, that they're doing. It's just all 14 national cemeteries in the national park system have to interpret and apply the law the same way. Right. So last year, um, as soon as I had the conversation with Sergeant Mack, um, they immediately went to elected officials and, and the Times and everything else and took it out of my hands. They went to the Washington office. The Washington office said, hey, we're going to do a review of all 14 national cemeteries, which they did. And in the meantime, we allowed status quo. So they were allowed to do their wreath laying and event last year in the national cemetery, um, same as Gaysburg College. But then August 15th of 2022, so just this past August, the National Park Service finished their review of the policy and the law and confirmed special events in national cemeteries are prohibited, except for Memorial Day, Veterans Day and other dates designated by the superintendent as having commemorative and historic significance to that national cemetery. Okay. So wreaths are okay. Mm -hmm. Chest thumping speeches, not okay. Because <laughs> that's kind of, well, but, oh, okay. I don't want to get into what they're all about, but I, it's because I don't really know. But I just read that article in the paper and I, there were some things I had more bones to pick with them than you. Um, so it's not allowed. <laughs> the ceremony period but you do have you said some discretion like the the superintendent can decide right like so the superintendent can designate dates designate dates okay so not events that have both 
Yep, they have both commemorative and historic significance to that national cemetery. So that's one to allow a special event. You must be historically, they must have a designated date, right. which has to be historic and uh, commemorative. So like first, and, second, and third of July. Correct. Okay. November 19th. November 19th. So correct. Right. And it must be official, meaning that event must be sponsored or co-sponsored by the National Park Service, which means it has to have a connection. Yeah. So in, in, in going to whoever they went to, Congress or, you know, over your head, trying to get their way, they accidentally kind of triggered a thing that came back and said, no, actually, you can't do this. Um, well, we already knew that. No, I know. But but, but I it, think they were thinking that they were going to show you. Show should, you, yeah. Well, I, I don't know what they're thinking. <laughs> um, I just know that, I, you know, again, I'm not here for myself. I'm here to yeah. do the right thing and to bring the park and ha its management into compliance with policy and regulation. And I'll, I'll try to do that in the best, most personable way I can. Yeah. And in that instance, I, I failed it. <laughs> Doing it in a way that um, was uh, allowed us to find common ground. We were unable to find common ground. So uh, is, it, is it fair to say that a lot of the things that a lot of us, people who have been coming here for decades, have gotten used to on the park were actually not really allowed, but kind of... I shouldn't say not really allowed. Obviously, they were allowed because we did them, but not they weren't sanctioned. They were not uh, they were prohibited in some cases. Yeah, I would say the park probably didn't um, apply due diligence to reviewing these activities um, in accordance with law and policy like they probably should have. Yeah. Okay. All right. We got one more call and then we're going to let uh, Steve get the uh, final word there and whatever he wants to say. Thank you, Beth, for the call. I and real go ahead. Quickly. Go ahead. Um, I don't know if you know my little role in this goofiness that we do on, on the live show on Fridays. Goofy. I, I know. I, I do news and events, right? So I remember when the whole Sergeant Mack first happened the, the first time and everybody lost their minds, seemingly everybody. Um, I will just tell you, there were a lot of folks that understood that the Park Service was not necessarily being the unreasonable organization there. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, there was a lot of give and take, I see even in the comments now, with folks that said, hey, look, if this is, if you're honestly just trying to honor the legacy of someone, placing the wreath should be enough. It shouldn't have to be. Thank you. I'm not saying chest thumping. Chest thumping. But yeah. look at me, look at why I'm doing this. You know, we have to have the attention on us kind of thing. The wreaths could have been placed and the, the Sentiment could have been <laughs> down at Meade's headquarters, and the, right? Yeah. Right, and the fact that they chose not to do that spoke in a lot of circles on social media, especially more loudly yeah, <laughs> than that, the Park Service. Absolutely. So, so thank you for explaining yeah. that, and and I just want you to know that you, I'm sure it kind of seemed like you were dangling out there by yourself for quite a bit of that because there was a lot of you know loud nonsense in the in the press and everything, but there were a lot of folks that understood. The policy and thought that they handled it. The the other organization handled it improperly. Yeah, or, poor, I, I, or poorly. Let me put it that that's, way. That's that's so, where I stand too on that whole thing. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Uh, okay, uh, three or four, West Virginia. Hey, Matt. And oh boy, hello, Mr. Hey. Tim. Hey. hey. <laughs> it's Cameron Mallow. He's shooting for the superintendent. You better duck. <laughs> Cameron, here's Best your big chance. This is this is the guy who wants your job, uh, Steve. So, oh boy. <laughs> well, Cameron, you and I should have coffee. <laughs> Cameron doesn't drink coffee. Cameron, it's Cameron hot chocolate. <laughs> He'll have hot chocolate. Mountain with you. Dew. Cameron, here's your one chance to dazzle the man who can make your dreams come true. Go. All right. Well, Mr. Sims, my question is: I've been now uh, working with the Park Service for three years. And since 2016, I've been a uh, volunteer with the Park Service. Um, and my goal is to get on at Gettysburg for at least one season and then see where it goes from there as an interpreter. Um, 2020, I made the big move. I actually have a place within five minutes of the battlefield behind the round top now. Nice. And this past summer, I took a big leap. I went all the way to North Dakota where I visited the other national parks and tried to learn more about myself, which I did and had a great time. But my all-time goal is still be at Gettysburg eventually. And Cameron, I'm what's your point? People have like... the bedtimes here. What's your point? Get to your point. <laughs> what else can I do to try to get that goal of working in Gettysburg on interpretive staff? Yes. How can Cameron... Uh, expedite uh, his dream here. 
So, Cameron, I would say that coming to Gettysburg is very difficult. Being an interpreter huh. at Gettysburg is a, a highly coveted position. Um, and you know why. I mean, we've got PhDs and, and people with master's degrees that are interpretive rangers. Um, and when they get in here, they stay. Mm. And I'm glad they stay because they are the mm -hmm. experts. They're phenomenal. And so, you know, two things. One, a vacancy comes up once in a blue moon. So that's going to be really tough. When it does come open, you are competing against the best of the best of the best, sir. I mean, it is highly competitive. Military, do they get preference? Military, Veterans? so it depends on how we announce it. Okay. So depending on if it's an entry-level job or a seasoned um, uh, job, yeah, we could announce it so anyone can apply, and that's when veterans' preference mm -hmm. um, kicks in. So that means veterans will move to the top of the list. Or it could be merit promotion. Uh, veterans can still apply, but they don't have preference in that scenario. So anyone, and this this goes for anybody wanting to be in the National Park Service, because it is, is one of the hardest agencies to get a job in, because it's the National Park Service. We are, it's such an awesome mission. Yeah. It's such an awesome Cool mission. hats. We have cool <laughs> hats. Yeah. Indeed. Ah, it's, it's awesome. Uh, so my suggestion for anybody that wants a job in the National Park Service is that you got to be mobile. To get it, your foot in the door, you got to be mobile. You know, apply, Meaning? Apply to, there's 423 yeah. national park units. Um, go on to USA Jobs and get your foot in the door by getting a job anywhere and get status. And once you have status, then you can apply to different jobs in a merit promotion style. You're not competing in the uh, full open sources jobs with veterans at that point, um, theoretically, depending on the announcement. Um, but that's one way to do it. Um, but again, Cameron, it is is extremely difficult. I, I'm just not going to lie to you. It's very hard. Um, I do wish you the best at getting your foot in the door and getting to Gettysburg because you know how special it is, and I thank you for that. All right, Cam? Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Are, are you okay? Yeah, I got – yeah. Okay. Just been grading cases all day. Oh, oh me. it sounded like you were crying. I <laughs> – I got all worried. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, so you're okay. You're not crying. <laughs> all right, so anything else that you'd like to ask uh, Superintendent Sims? No, I just uh, hope that maybe this year could be a year I get a job closer to Gettysburg or back or at Gettysburg. I'm just hoping. Well, so. if you want closer, I know McDonald's on Steinware was hiring. I'm not going back Words. I'm going forward. Okay, good boy. All right, Cameron. Hey, we're doing a regular show tomorrow, Cam, so I hope to call you. You call in, okay? Are we? Uh, uh, yeah, we are. Uh, right. Otherwise, uh, we got to go. So have a good night, Cam. Oh, sorry, I just hung up on him. All right. <laughs> Superintendent. I have, I have yeah. one real quick. This is such a weird uh, obsession with me, and I don't know oh, why. My. So, like, the little black rectangular markers that say <laughs> Peach Orchard, for example, or Wentz Farms, or something. There's not one on the Forney Farm, and I'm sure there are other locations where mm. there aren't. Where did those originate? Who decided what was going to get marked? Is there any way fundraisers could be done to place something? Like if somebody spearheaded like the round table or something? I'm just kind of curious. Like I don't know why I'm fixated on that, but, but for, yeah. for sure the Forney Farm was a pretty important location, right? And even for the dedication of the Peace Memorials, yada, yada. But there's nothing there that like marks. But then like random things like the Wentz Farm is marked. And I'm kind of like, okay, you know, I don't know. Just curious. I don't know the answer specifically, but it's likely you got to go back to when the commission was developing the park and when those things initially came out. And then when it got transferred over to the National Park Service, we tried to preserve and protect those markers as they were. Mm -hmm. We weren't in the business of creating new markers mm -hmm. like they did. Um, that doesn't mean there might not be a need to identify a place or to guide people to a place um, of importance. And so that, that's something that we can evaluate, but it may not be the same mark because those are historic. And those are you know, part of the, was it, 1,328 markers and monuments that we have in the battlefield. And we want to make sure that we preserve and protect what we already have. Okay. That's interesting. Is there anything else that you would like to add uh, in closing? Well, I just want to thank you all and everyone listening and all of the callers. I mean, this has been a, an enjoyable experience. I hope so. And I hope informative for everyone. And I know I, I didn't provide so. the answers that people wanted in some cases, <laughs> but at least you heard it from me. Yeah. 
And uh, I had the opportunity, and I thank you for that. Absolutely. And, I thank uh, you for accepting the offer. I look forward to coming back someday if you'll have me. I, I was just going to say, if you're up for it, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I would love to do this once a quarter with you like I, like I do with Chris Gwynn. Um, he does interpretation, obviously. You come on and just talk about general stuff. I think it would be great. I think the audience would like it. You're on. All right. Very good. Thank you so much. Yes. Seriously. Thank you very cool. much. Steve Sims, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first time on the show. First podcast ever, right? First ever. Ever. Oh. Wow. Thank first you of so much. many now. Yes, really. Uh, thank you all for listening. I, I saw we had uh, good numbers there with uh, viewers and everything like that. Right around 150 the yeah, whole time. Yeah, pretty good. Positive pretty good. Feedback. You got to come on every week, Steve. <laughs> yeah, I, a lot of positive <laughs> feedback. In fact, so positive, somebody wants you to be their GPS voice. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh, is that good? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's very calming, calming and soothing. Voice. Yeah. Wow. Good for you, Steve. Nobody ever said that to me. So good for you. Same. <laughs> all right. Uh, that's about it. So we're going to uh, uh, get going. Thank you all for uh, joining us. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. We're going to do our Friday show tomorrow because I'm going to be in Pittsburgh, October 8th, and Book Club, 830. And what else, Ronnie? That's it, right? Goodbye. Addressing Gettysburg host. today is hosted oh. by Matt Callery and Veronica Brestensky Esquire. Produced by Eric, the producer, Moni. <laughs> Applause led by Owen the Clabber. Guests of Addressing Gettysburg today stay wherever they want. That's not our concern. To be a guest on the show, send an email to eric at addressinggettysburg.com. Addressing Gettysburg broadcasts from the Gettys Bike Tour Studios. Get a 15% discount on your next tour with Gettys Bike. I'm Huevos Grande, the voice of Addressing Gettysburg today. Thanks for listening. like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. It's not a chicken.